Welcome everybody. My name is Judith Rosser Davis. I'm Head of Government Relations and Education and Chair of the BFC Colleges Council. Um, each year we have our annual graduate preview, which allows industries professionals um, access to the top portfolios from the graduating fashion talent that's emerging from our incredible uh, fashion colleges around the UK. And we aim to foster relationships between educators, graduates and the industry. Um, we're going to put in the link to the graduate preview portfolios um, as a web link and as well as sort of profiling the top talent to the industry and beyond, we have our graduate preview day, which runs a series of events that support um, the students with the tips and knowledge that they need about how to take those next important steps into our industry, whether it's insights from getting your first job or need to know advice when setting up a fashion business. Um, today, we've got a range of top industry professionals um, who'll be sharing with us the kind of do's and don'ts when entering the world of work. Um, and it's never been more important to us to make sure that everyone feels welcome in our industry. So I'm really pleased that today we're having our session, to this session around navigating your way into the fashion industry as a marginalized or minority voice. And I'd like to particularly thank Daniel Peters, who's been instrumental in our DNI committee's work uh, for curating um, this talk. Um, Daniel's a founder and lead strategist of Fashion Minority Report. Um, and he's joined by Nadine, who's marketing project manager at Pang Pangia, Lima, who's a designer with Paul Smith Men's, and Liam, who's a client partner at Fashion and Luxury um, Media Monks at Media Monks. So um, this is a very interactive session. Um, we've got lots of people on the call. We'd really encourage you to post your questions into the chat. And what I'll be doing is um, at about five to three, just um, interrupting the session so we could bring students on to ask the questions. And it would be wonderful if students would like to join uh, visibly and actually pose their questions to the panel. That would be fantastic. But a warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us today. Really, really interested to hear more in this session. So thank you. Over to you, Daniel. Good to go. Thank you very much. Yes, good to go. Let's do this. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, <laughs> See you in a bit. <laughs> See you in a bit. Um, firstly, thank you to Judith, Dominic, Rebecca and the British Fashion Council for having us um, to talk today about the fashion industry and actually our experiences of getting into the industry. It's such an important topic at this time to navigate in the wake of the George Floyd murder and Black Lives Matter as a protest and movement last year, a great deal of change has been made, um, but actually there's still a great deal of work that needs to be done. And for myself and my guests here today, we're really looking forward to getting into it. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna pose a question to all of you first, which is to firstly, please tell me um, what the core function of your role is within your business. And actually I'm gonna go straight to Lima to start with. Hi, um, so my name is Lima Ali. Um, I work as a designer for Paul Smith and I work on the PS Men's Ready to Wear line. So I design um, shirts and trousers and casual tailoring specifically. And I work on some special projects as well. When you say special projects, what does that mean? So kind of exclusives for wholesalers and any sort of collaborations, um, that kind of thing. Nice. And just kind of sticking on that for a moment, how has the experience been for you having things like special projects over the past year because of COVID? Has it been a challenge or? Yes, definitely. Obviously, working with my own team, uh, I'm used to working with them. So doing that remotely is so much easier um, because you have that bond and relationship. And when you're working with um, retailers, um, it's it's kind of getting your teeth into it is a little bit harder because it's all via email and you can't see them in person but I think we've managed quite well with with the communication within our own teams and their their teams to to fulfill the brief so it's been okay it's been okay oh good no because I know for some people it's been a challenge pivoting from being in an office space with other people to then actually being remotely especially with something like design but again I think having tools like zoom or Microsoft Teams were able to be efficient in that process. 
Yeah, we also do go in a few days a week in the office to pick out fabrics or anything specific that needs to be hands on, but most of it is from home now. So we've 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 learnt. Adapted. Nice. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Nadine, coming on to you, it'd be lovely to hear about what your role involves. Yes, well, um, hi everyone, I'm Nadine. Um, I'm the marketing project manager at Pangaya. Um, and basically I'm responsible for managing all projects through the brand marketing, content and creative production teams. Um, that includes like liaising with our creative agency on current and upcoming campaigns, um, creative operations. I'd probably say a big function of my role is the focus um, is focusing on ensuring that there's a successful delivery of all projects by making sure that all the timelines um, are aligned with the critical path, the moving parts are kind of like running smoothly. Um, so that's, I'd say that's a core function of my role. I mean, it sounds pretty heavy lifting and actually as if you're, <laughs> as if you have to be very involved and uh, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of as efficient at running your diary to make sure that you're across everything. Yes, definitely making sure that all the deliverables are, you know, um, delivered in time, making sure that everybody's kind of like following the deadlines and the by whens because everything just can kind of, if you miss something, it will end up having the largest ripple effect and could potentially end up affecting launch. So I'm just kind of like that coordinator to help, you know, push things forward and make sure that things are kept on track. And I guess as, a, as another question now, how many projects are you typically juggling at any one time? at any one time. Um, so I guess for us, each uh, campaign, product launch, um, brand activation is classed as a project and we probably have a launch weekly. Um, and I guess if you think about, we probably start working on our briefs eight to 10 weeks in advance. So I'd say juggling about eight projects at a time. Um, so yeah, it is quite, there is a bit of like heavy lifting and you know, a lot of like little bits and finicky parts that you kind of always need to, keep an eye on so it's a lot to juggle but I enjoy it no nice and I guess in the words of Beyonce because I've always got to have a Beyonce reference <laughs> it's keeping things in formation um yeah. because you know actually it's such a quick turnaround you've got to make sure you've got everything working to the kind of minute or to the second so that it actually works efficiently yes 100 percent. couldn't have said it better <laughs> myself <laughs> thank you um and Liam coming to you please tell us more about your role so I'm client partner and the head of a division called Flux, which is the fashion and luxury division within Media Monks, which is a global creative and production agency. So I work with clients across the globe to come up with different solutions to meet their business or commercial objectives. And that can span anything from running social campaigns, building new websites, creating campaign work, it can really vary. And it, that's part of why I love, love my role is getting to work with so many different people globally on, on creative solutions. No, amazing. And how many, how many people are there within your team who are actually helping you to get the work done? So the core team within our division is 10 people and we work across many different briefs but the whole organization is around 5,000 people globally. But I'm able to connect my fashion specialism with various different capabilities, whether that is platforms or experiential. So we're a potent team, but connected to a bigger group. Nice, and obviously this is such a recent addition to the Media Monks family, um, your division. How has it been setting it up? It's been incredibly exciting to set up something new given the year that we've had last year and it's been amazing to have that sort of global network and offering digital focused solutions to clients because I think as an industry we've realized the importance of digital uh, after last year and having the sort of strategic conversations I have with clients to help build their business and make it stronger uh, it's really been uh, enjoyable getting to do that for sure. And I think to that point that you made there, the fashion industry to some extent has been really slow to adopt the change of digital. Um, and it's been a bit of a, a push and a struggle. And that's why we've seen, I think, so many brands leave the high street over the past year in particular, because they didn't really adapt to change. Um, how do you help your brands to navigate that? 
So we, we always start strategically first. So we really analyze who is your target consumer? Where do they play? Where can we find them? And how do we then create materials that are gonna be appealing to them, but mm -hmm. also use data in a robust way to, to underpin any of our assumptions or insights. I think fashion can get guilty of somehow, not guilty, we, we do predict trends, we do make trends within, within our industry, but when it comes to understanding customers, you do need to have a robust data practice to make sure that you're targeting them in a smart fashion. So we're able to offer that solution to, to clients. Completely, and I think actually for students who are graduating now, it's really actually being able to understand that data is our friend um, in terms of how we're able to grow and develop our businesses, whether it's something that we start our, on our own or if we go into another company, it's so important that whilst data might seem like it's not something that's initially in your division, actually taking it on board is really important because it helps us to grow. Absolutely. Cool. Um, thank you so much for uh, kicking things off with that way. I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and just say, well, not say, but how did you prepare yourselves professionally when you were going into industry as you kind of left um, studying? Uh, Liam, I'm going to stick with you and ask you to start on that one. Well, I think I, I had an interesting background. So I studied international relations and diplomacy. So I would say my studies actually equipped me with what I needed for this, this sector. So critical thinking and the ability to evaluate differing forms of opinion uh, at once has been very, very helpful. Uh, I would say conflict resolution. So how do you ensure that all sides of a disagreement or conflict feel that they're being heard and everyone has a stake in the peaceful re resolution of an issue? I think that's very important when you're entering the work environment, you have to manage a lot of conflicting opinions. <laughs> and then diplomacy. So the art of dealing with people in a sensitive and tactful way. We are creatives, this is a creative industry. And sometimes you, you read, not sometimes, you always need to be mindful of, of how people may feel about their creative ideas having to be changed or altered in any way. So I would say, being trained in diplomacy has come in very useful. Completely. And I can see the, you know, the three of us here nodding because <laughs> diplomacy is incredibly important working in the creative industry because we, we all want our views and our opinions and our ideas to be seen, heard and taken forward. But it's not always possible because there are so many other opinions which need to be taken into consideration. Um, so thank you for that. I love that. Um, Nadine, coming to you. How did you prepare yourself professionally to get into industry? So I would have initially said interning before I started, you know, like paid work. However, I probably say I started much earlier than that. And in hindsight, didn't actually intern for incredibly long. Um, so I probably say at the end of secondary school, or high school, um, however you may say it, I probably say I specifically chose um, my college as I knew they had connections with London College of Fashion. Um, which from very young was the university that I was determined to go to. Um, and that connection allowed me to get things like portfolio advice from the LCF tutors prior to uh, applying and get my name just even like in the room, um, taking part in programs like um, the Fashion Awareness Direct, Fashion Futures um, program, which landed my face in the, in the newspaper in the end. Um, it ends in a competition and although I didn't win the competition, um, it's an organization that I stayed involved with over the following years that then, you know, landed me helping out and things like backstage at London Fashion Week shows, for example, um, even things like um, participating in summer schools, like before and during university and exposing myself to those like new learning opportunities um, and just honestly, just expanding my network. I feel like any chance to develop my skills and be around a diverse group of people um, was just something that was kind of, you know, I was always looking for. Um, and I still talk to some of those people today. So um, I think that definitely uh, helped. <laughs> nice. And I think to that point, it's not always about the winning. Um, I think sometimes we can be so focused on what we need to achieve and what, and, and how we need to succeed. And I think sometimes we, we, we try and navigate the world with this, I've got to be number one. I think it's important that we do want to strive for success, 
mm-hmm. but also we shouldn't really allow society to determine what success looks like for us we need to carve mm-hmm. out our own paths um mm-hmm. thank you very much and uh lima lastly coming to you um so i i took a very traditional route of going to university and studying fashion design um so that on my course i learned a lot about the technical aspects of design and learning to pattern cut and construct and that kind of equipped me to be able to understand design better um and I also created like a, a design portfolio that I could take to interviews um and I did a year in industry which uh is interning um and I think that was really key because I went on to then work for the company that I interned with and um it was a good way to network and make make connections and meet people in the industry and then work on project projects outside of uni to to sort of build on that and build on experiences of like styling and photography shoots and stuff like that. So yeah, I'd say the base level was my university, but most of it did come from on hands-on experience in the industry. Completely. And sticking with you in a question just for you, when you graduated from Leeds University, um, why did you choose to go in-house for a brand and not start your own thing? Because obviously there can be a a bit of conflict there is, do I do my own thing, which takes a lot of money, time, energy and commitment, or do I go in-house for a business that already exists? So I would love to have my own brands, like inshallah one day that's like on the cards for me. But I think I felt that I needed to have more knowledge and experience of how, how the business works and I think that's, I want to do it successfully and not just jump into it and then fail, you know? So um, I started off in a very small brand. Um, It was a team of seven and we all kind of mucked in and all worked together. So I got to see all aspects of like marketing, production, logistics, and how everything sort of works behind the scenes as well as design. And then now I've gone from a team of seven to like a company that employs 1000 people worldwide and it's just a vast pool of expertise and experiences and knowledge that I can like pull from and use and resources that I can use to, to gain more knowledge. Um, there's a, there's a, I'm gonna quote now. <laughs> there's a quote from Muhammad Ali that says, um, I try to learn as much as I can because I know nothing compared to what I need to know. So there's always like that strive to, to know more, to do more, to like, better myself so I can be successful so I think that's does that answer the question it does answer the question I think as well though you know as minority voices in the industry sometimes we do have to work that little bit harder so building the right foundations and really understanding the business inside out can often be a useful tool and technique so that you're able to move forward as best as possible so here for that love the quote if it was Beyonce I'd have loved it more but it's fine (laughs) Not going to go into that. Um, Thank you. So a question for all of you. Um, How important has it been for all of you to build a network of people who look like you or share common similarities or that you share common similarities with? Um, Liam, I'm going to start with you, please. So I would say building a network is crucial. And you shouldn't limit it to people who look like you. Yes, that's one place to start. But I think finding your tribe of people that share your common interests, whether it's art, music, uh, food, it doesn't matter. But the more that you find people within the industry that you have an alignment with, um, reach out to them, connect with them, invest in those relationships, and it will carry you very far because you never know where people end up especially as you guys being graduates, the people that you are, were school, in school with and studied with, you guys are gonna go so far in so many different places, keep in touch because you never know how you may be of benefit to each other down the road, but don't be so narrow to keep it to, well, I only wanna to talk to people who look like me or share a sec- my sexuality. Keep it broad and look into people that you connect with as, as people. Completely. And Lima, what about you? So it's not often that I come across people that that look like me in in a professional capacity, a bar to different people. Um, But um, I think for me, I always find it quite refreshing to to connect with people that are um, black and people of color because it's it's interesting for me to see how 
they're overcoming their struggles within within the industry and they might have advice for me of how to navigate myself and how to push myself forward um so I always I always love meeting people um but I agree with Liam like you shouldn't you shouldn't filter it down to just people who look like you but there's something else I've noticed about ethnic minorities is that we have a community spirit and there's always this we want to help each other. Oh, I know someone who who would be good at this, and and I and they're also they just happen to be ethnic minorities. But we built like we lift each other up, which I find like it's just so heartwarming. Yeah, for sure, one hundred percent. I'll comment on all of this afterwards. But uh, Nadine, coming to you first. Um, yeah, I'd say it's incredibly, incredibly important. And I can't stress the importance of like networking and having a group of connections in different parts of the industry um, enough. Um, and to Lima's point, um, there is a great sense of solidarity within our community, where I feel like you feel the need to help other minorities that look like you kind of first knowing that we might not get exposed to the same amount of opportunities through our career as our peers would. Um, yeah, and you never know what rooms your names are being mentioned in, honestly. <laughs> um, no, yeah. So I second that. No, cool. And I think to actually all of those points, on one hand, do communicate and connect with the people who look like you, that you share a similarity with, but also to Liam's point, don't limit yourself by only connecting and communicating with within our own communities, because actually you never know where you're going to be able to seek support and guidance and a future opportunity. Um, so I think it's, for me, I check my LinkedIn um, more often than I probably check my Instagram these days, yeah. because it's so important to have that professional foundation where I can just um, speak about navigating the industry or anything that I'm working on and to celebrate other people because I think it's so important to celebrate others, your peers, within what they do, their successes, their highs, their lows, all of it. Um, so thank you for that. Um, another question for all of you, but is how do you ensure that you turn up to work as your authentic self? Um, I see everybody looking to the, to the roof there going, mm, how do I do that? Um, <laughs> Nadine, I'm going to kick off with you. Okay. Um, I'd probably say, although at times I found it a little daunting, um, I guess, for example, you know, the classic when I change my hairstyle, like the first day back at work would give me literal anxiety. And I'd spend the day kind of preparing myself for the potential, you know, like microaggressions that might come my way. Um, but despite all of that, I would still, I guess, just just do it because the only person that you can be is yourself. And why should we dim our lights and forfeit our individuality to fit in with the people around us? Um, it's better to show up and be your authentic self than portray a version of you that you think people want to see um, as that person will always be different. Um, and it's exhausting. <laughs> 100% snaps for all of that, like 100%. <laughs> percent so I'm giving like a, a Reese with a spoon moment there but <laughs> I'm here for every single moment of that sentiment. <laughs> um, Lima what about you? I think as a person I've always been quite like open and on, on, honest about who I am and I think as long as you're sort of you communicate what your values beliefs and and who you are and speak openly about your culture and like what you like I think people respond to that and if you're genuinely you then they're gonna like you and, and if they don't know that's their problem but I think most people do they they respond to that well completely and I think that's so true in our industry that when you do turn up as just whoever you are um I think that we are respected and valued in that way so thank you uh, Liam coming to you I would say I've I've been sure to bring my authentic self to work every day by turning that into my superpower. So I'm of more value to the company because of who I am. I'm more about, I've lived in six countries. I am a gay black male. I have value to give by virtue of those things. And when you recognize that and you realize it's not an impediment in any way, it's actually your superpower, you will, can, you will go very, very far if you position it that way mentally. Uh, and I think to that point, we are all of great asset and value to companies as our authentic selves. And I turn up as me 
every day, no matter what the party is, no matter what the vibe is, because if you can't accept me for who I am, then I don't want to be part of that. And I think that's so true for how we move in, how as for yourselves as graduates, and even if you're not a graduate, continue to keep that mentality because actually it's what drives us forward. It's what actually helps us to challenge the status quo and become industry leaders. So thank you all for all of those comments. Um, Liam, sticking with you again, um, you've not had a clear path into fashion, as you say. Uh, you previously studied international relations and diplomacy, but how did you then end up working for the likes of Bauman and Bellstaff? It's a combination of luck and strategy. So I was lucky enough to have had within my network, people that said, you would be good at marketing and advertising, give it a try. So through those networks and those contacts, I was able to secure an internship within the, the creative industries. And I realized I loved it and I, I started to do very, very well. And I reached a point in my career where I enjoyed my job role. So working with clients and internal teams but I wasn't loving the industry that I was doing it for, the brands that I was working with. So at that point I got strategic and thought, if I wanna focus at fashion and luxury, how do I get to that position? How do I get into those places? And again, it's your network. You turn to your network, you look at the people that you know who are able to help you get into those rooms and into those positions. So I, when I made the move to London, cause I was in Amsterdam um, previously, I was very focused to talk to the people that I knew who worked at agencies that worked with the brands that I wanted to work for. And that's how I ended up uh, where I am today. So it is a bit of luck, let's not lie. We have to be in the right place at the right time, but you do need to give your future some strategic thought and planning. Yeah, and I think what I add to that is that we shouldn't always be so fixated on what we think we want to do always. I think we should also be open to pivoting um, because sometimes opportunities arise that we may not think is something that we want to go into. I mean, I wanted to be a visual merchandiser, considering I've worked in the fashion industry for 16, 17 years. I've never been a visual merchandiser, but instead I've produced runway shows, global events and global showrooms, all because I was open to that opportunity for my first job at Burberry, where they said, well, how about you do this with us and for us? And I thought, don't know it really that well but actually I'll give it a go and actually it's created a solid foundation for my career over the years so um, thank you very much for that Liam. Um, coming back to all of you it's glaringly obvious when we are one of the few black or brown people at an organization what can employers do to address this imbalance? Um, Lima coming to you. I think seeing is believing so the more people that we see like us in a room in the creative industry the more confidence it gives us to occupy that space so in terms of what an employer can do um lots of stuff but i might just talk about a few in like recruitment process firstly needs to be a bit more inclusive um i found with design if you want to even get an interview you have to have a 2-1 degree qualification and i think that's so limiting to a certain socioeconomic background that it, it completely wipes out all the people that could be super creative, could be great at the job, but just don't or haven't had the opportunity to go to university. So I think the way employers approach the recruitment process needs to be changed or adapted to, to involve more people. And then secondly, I'd say that promotion opportunities. So when you look at a company, you can clearly see there aren't people of color, black people in decision-making positions or manager positions, or there aren't many. So you can see that they're not getting the same opportunities. Um, so first thing is let them in the door and then let them move up. So that's what I'd, I'd kind of recommend. 100%, thank you so much. I completely agree with that. Um, Liam, what about you? I, I basically have to repeat what Lima said. I think <laughs> it would be three things. First of all, it is, raise greater awareness that these jobs exist. So a lot of communities don't know that there are great career options in the fashion industry, in the creative industries. It's not a side hobby. It can be a very successful, vibrant career, but we need to go out into those communities and make that known. So we need to spread awareness. 
then we need to change the recruitment process. So how we evaluate candidates needs to be based on skills, not necessarily where they got those skills from, but do they have the skills and do they have the ability to grow and progress in the organization as opposed to picking from the narrow pool of people that you have worked with or that went to that school. It's too narrow mm -hmm. of a pool and it's gonna stifle our industry, which should be creative. And then thirdly, it is retention. It's how do we make sure that the spaces and places that we have are inclusive and do meet the needs of everyone. That means people with different levels of ability, people from different backgrounds. It, it's broader than just skin color or race or gender. And, and we really need to do more to bring in different communities of all stripes and colors um, in actively, not just saying we want to, but actively bring them in. Yeah, less performative action and just more action. Yeah, 100%. get on the streets. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Nadine, what about you? Um, I'd honestly just like to echo what Lima and Liam have just said. Um, I'd say that they can do this by taking that first step of acknowledging their unconscious bias and creating that equal opportunity by actively widening their recruitment pool. Um, ensuring that during yeah, the hiring process, they're taking the steps to ensure that they have a diverse range of, range of candidates um, that they're interviewing for these positions. And I'd just like to point out at all levels, so entry to senior management. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, mic drop, yes. <laughs> um, and I think the only thing I add to that is removing the nepotism um from the industry the fashion and creative industry is incredibly nepotistic it's always who knows who and and of course that can work in different ways but especially when people are starting out it's like well somebody's mummy and daddy knows somebody's cousin and uncle and then they're brought in and actually have they been given that opportunity because they're good at what they do or just based on who they know and it's mm -hmm. time for us to erase this notion of only being able to break into the fashion industry which is often quite elitist as an industry and actually making it seem like a viable option for anybody no matter what their walk of life because coming from a single parent working class family I, I thought that I could be anything I wanted to be so I, I, I allowed myself that opportunity but not everybody has that mindset so we need to be able to equip people at different points in the life of seeing that no matter who they are, they can get into a space. Um, thank you for that. And Nadine, sticking with you, and this is a question just for you. How do you see your role evolving over the next couple of years? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I guess over the next couple of years, I see myself really coming into my own um, here at Pangaea and developing my hard and soft skills in more ways than one. Um, Role-wise, I'd like to start getting a little bit more involved in campaigns and brand activations from a more creative standpoint um, through things like ideation and concepting. Um, but I would say a pro of working for a high growth startup like this one is, I'd probably say the, the flexibility. Um, you have the ability to make your role your own as you go along, um, unlike, let's say, if I was to work for a, maybe a bigger corporation. Um, Cool. No, I agree with that. And I just for anybody who's listening now or later, Pangaea is such an incredible brand who are changing the landscape of fashion, especially when we actually think about sustainability in a true sense, because a lot of companies are greenwashing when it comes to sustainability and what they're doing. But actually, Pangaea has this great, great blueprint, which they're putting out there for the world to be able to utilize. And I think Moments like that are great, but I also see their team and their team is incredibly diverse. There are a lot of women at the forefront of the business who are driving equitability and industry leaders. Um, and I think that's so great to see. Um, my next question, which is for all of you, and that's not like I just love Pangaea, just to say like, <laughs> I love all brands equally, but I know that Pangaea is doing great things. This isn't yeah. an endorsement or an ad, um, <laughs> but I just want to highlight that for any young people who are looking into roles. Pangaea is a brand that you should definitely look into, as is Paul Smith um, or Media Monks. Um, next question. Um, 
what do you enjoy most about working in the fashion and creative industry? Liam, I'm going to come straight to you with that question. I would say I love that it is dynamic. It's always changing. And for me, it is I'm constantly learning. I have the opportunity to work with a lot of talented people from many different disciplines around the world who are a lot better than me in many different things. So the fact that I've been in this career for over 15 years and I'm still learning is something that I, I really enjoy. Completely. Thank you. And Nadine, coming back to you. Um, I'd probably say, although there is a lot of work to be done and things to be unlearned um, within the fashion industry, I would say if there is an industry that will embrace people's individuality and uniqueness, it's this one. Um, yeah, and I've known that I've always wanted to be in the fashion or creative industry I, because it's, it's exciting, it's innovative and something that will kind of continue to live on through the test of time. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and Lima, coming back to you. Wow, great answers, guys. Um, <laughs> for me, it's it's being able to create something that's like from scratch, that's my own, and being able to draw and for a living and get paid for it. I just think that's such a win. And um, seeing some somebody wear something that I've designed on the street and being, oh, that's mine. That's honestly like a really special thing for me. So that's why I love the industry. Nice, thank you. Um, and I'm aware that we will be coming up close soon to uh, questions from the audience of which there are a couple. I've got another question right now, which is, what is a piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? Um, Lima, sticking with you, what would you say? I would say, be unapologetically yourself. Be proud of who you are and what makes you who you are. Um, because if you accept yourself, uh, trust me that they will too, everyone will. Thank you. Love that. Really, really, really love that. Um, Nadine, what about you? Um, I'd probably say, honestly, that there will be people that will derail your journey or try to try to derail your journey along the way. But just trust and believe in yourself. Um, you worked just as hard, if not harder, um, than some of your peers, and you deserve a seat at the table just like everybody else. Yeah, completely. Um, and Liam, what about you? I would say, I would have said to myself, network. So when you attend anything, whether it is educational, recreational, professional, chances are you're gonna meet people there that are gonna be able to help you in some way in the future. So look for that spot that, invest in that. And then the second piece of advice would be, do not be so hard on yourself. It is a tough, tough time right now. Everyone has taken a massive setback from every, any level, any industry, anywhere. And at the moment, you guys are coming out into the job market. It is difficult, but understand that it's difficult for everybody. You are not behind. There's nothing you can do differently. You've done an amazing job to get to this stage. So don't be too hard on yourself. Yeah, um, and what I just add to that is be kind to yourself, really, actually uh, take the time to understand and navigate whatever the world is right now for you. Um, and also to Liam's point about networking, look for us on, on LinkedIn after this and add us because actually it starts to grow your professional network. And I think moments like that or talks that you get to listen in on are so important to then actually connect with the people if you found them inspiring in some way. Um, and I'm going to stop talking for a minute. I have more questions if needs be. Um, but Judith, over to you. Hi, thank you. Thank you all. That was absolutely inspirational. Thanks for sharing your stories and your thoughts. Um, yeah, we do have some questions. I just want to encourage everyone on the call that if, if you want to ask a question, if you're happy to come on and ask a question, I, I will check that with you. But if you want to just post a question to me in the chat and I can ask that anonymously for you, then I'm happy to do that as well. So we're keen to make this interactive. So um, the first one, maybe I'll start to you, Daniel, to sort of start, start us off. Um, do you find that people will try and put you in a um, and, and try and box you into what they think black people are or underlying racist tones coming through and how, I guess it would be good to know how you've dealt with that or advice you can give. 
Um, so one instance that comes to mind as being more of a frequent or a constant has been when I've initially said to people in the past that I've worked for Burberry, um, their immediate response is, oh, what store at the time was it? Like, what store did you do you work in? Or what store did you work in? And whilst there is nothing wrong with working in a retail capacity at all, because I've done it and I would still do it if I needed to today, it's just the way that people perceive or make an assumption that based on who I am, that I work in a retail industry. So then the SAS comes out and the SAS is, oh, well, actually, I didn't work in a retail capacity. Um, actually, I produced the runway shows and the global events and the global showrooms. And that's not to be a show off, but it's actually to showcase the fact that, again, no matter who I am, no matter what walk of life I'm from, I am able to achieve anything I want and that I can't be put in a box. And I think it's so important that we as people give each other the opportunity to be their authentic selves without trying to dim their lights with words. Um, so I think as a simple answer to kind of how you deal with those, those experiences, I think it's being able to nip something in the bud by helping somebody to understand that their thoughts and their opinions in, those, in that moment are not supportive or helpful or helping to move things forward. And that's mm -hmm. what I'll say on that. Well, I think as well, you know, to anyone on the call who can support someone to be their authentic self, or if you witness a situation like this, to, to offer the support as well is important, isn't it? Um, yeah, exactly. Anyone else want to come in with thoughts on that? I think any kind of advice would be would be gratefully received. I, I would say to the points we made earlier also, you don't need to be, you don't need to go along with it or be apologetic for calling things out. That's something that I have realized when I started out, the amount of times I just stifled it, kept it under my breath, pretended not to hear it. Don't do that anymore. You're free mm. to speak yourself and say, if something is wrong or incorrect, um, correct them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the next question, um, design is dynamic and you mentioned you love to draw and the satisfaction of seeing your designs in real life. Is the space of technical design development changing to a more valued skill set? Um, and I guess the, the question frames around low, low paid labor, you know, these essential roles like pattern cutting and garment tech. Um, who'd like to lead on, on that? Can go. Uh, go for so it. I think pattern cutting is such a skill and it's, we still use it at Paul Smith. Like we work really closely with the pattern cutters to make sure that our designs go from what I've sketched to what we want it to look like. And, and it's a good like way to problem solve because I might not have thought, some, thought about something when I've drawn a line somewhere and they can help me with their knowledge of like, this is, there's a neater way of making this, the better way of making this. So I would never diminish or like belittle that skill set because I think it's the most, one of the most important things that you need to know as a fashion designer is how to and cut and how something is made. Absolutely. Any other thoughts on that? Um, I guess it's sort of one of the areas of the industry where I was sort of trying to promote some of these, these roles that you don't see as, as visibly but are absolutely essential and the worth that they bring. I mean, all I'd really add to that is, you know, pattern cutting is such a wonderful skill to, to be able to have and to kind of possess. And um, I have a, a, a menswear brand on the side of everything else I do, um, but I work with a really incredible pattern cutter, pattern cutter called Richard, who's based in East London, and he cuts for Dunhill, he cuts for Reese, he cuts for so many wonderful businesses and brands, and it's so, um, it's so distant and varied in that sense but yeah. his skill is so useful and necessary and I think actually we need to show a lot more love to roles in this space because I think yeah. in the fashion industry we can be so focused on the kind of pure play creative roles and the fact that they are the dominant culture in our industry i.e being a designer or a photographer or a stylist or even a model and I think with the British fashion industry employing over 800,000 people, not every single one of them are pure play creatives. It's so important that we give the respect and care to all of these different roles. 
I, I agree. And I think also it's the sort of pathways in that you can then lead to some of these other roles, right? The opportunities in to sort of see the industry and where that leads. And I think it's really important in your career. The journey, I mean, I'm now at an age where I'm looking back almost more than I'm looking forward. And, and you suddenly realise the path that you took was just as important as where you thought you wanted to go. And quite often it takes you into these different experiences. I can see Liam nodding. <laughs> Did you have that experience, Liam? <laughs> Absolutely. I think when you look back at your career and you think, you, I've learned something from each of those steps, which I might have thought was a misstep. It wasn't. Yeah. You're doing fine. Keep going. You're right. You, it is valuable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, we don't have any other questions at the moment. If anyone wants to pop them in the chat, then I'm happy to raise them. Was there any other points you wanted to talk through, Daniel? Um, I will ask this question. Um, were any of you the first within your families to go to university? Um, and if so, what was that like as an experience? Because you didn't necessarily, I guess, have somebody to soundboard that with and to. Um, Lima, I know that you actually were the first in your family, so perhaps you could answer that. Yeah, so I have an older sister who went on to study fine art as she stayed at home for university. I was the first girl to move away from my family and coming from a South Asian Muslim family, that's such a massive step. Like you don't do that. You don't go and have your dreams. Um, so that was, it was a kind of a, a struggle with the family and the community of being allowed to go and do that and then doing it successfully and then getting a job in it because obviously I don't know like there's a there's a there's a thing in our society where it's like doctors lawyers and engineers have this respect respect but like designers don't really because it's like oh it's a job oh you draw what does that mean um how do you eat so it's like it's, it's, it's changing that thought process and convincing my family that I can do this, but it's, when you're, when you're so young, you've got to really believe in yourself to convince someone who's older than you to be like, I can do this, trust me, and then doing it. So I think that was my experience of not just, not just fighting the world, but also trying to convince my family. And I think to that point, your family is really the first step. When we look at ethnic minority families, um, there is a battle, there is a struggle towards convincing them that what you want to do is a worthwhile career choice and option and goal and that you'll be able to succeed. And actually success, again, depending on however you define it, it's so achievable in our industry. I mean, look at us all here and what we've been able to go on and do in, in, in our lengths of time of working in industry. Um, anybody else got anything to add to that point? Um, yes, I guess I have a, a shorter answer, but I don't believe I wasn't the first person in my um, family to attend you in university, but I was the first to attend, I guess, in this kind of capacity um, at that kind of level, shall I say. Um, and it was it was a lot of pressure. It was definitely a lot of pressure, especially going to the university that, you know, I, I did attend like everybody's heard of it. You know, it's I just kind of feel like everybody's there's like a watchful eye over you. Um, like, will she do well? What's going to happen? You know, even once I left, like, what are you going to do now? Um, but yeah, it was a lot of pressure, but I still, I felt very supported. Um, and I had people that I could turn to if I needed. Um, yeah, this is a very short answer, but just yeah, but know, I, I do a little two cents. <laughs> I love that. And I think also why I love that is because, again, we all have such a different experience. It's not always going to be the same experience coming from an ethnic minority family. You know, it, I remember when I went to the Brit school, my mum's question was, are you sure you're going to get in? And I was like, well, that's helpful, isn't it? Thanks. <laughs> but I got in. That's the point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Liam, did you have anything else to add? For me, it would be in terms of the industry I've ended up in, no one else in my family is in the creative industry. They very much followed that pathway of doctor, lawyer, the traditional successful in, um, jobs and for me now it's just been a it's been great for me to show to them that you can be successful in these industries and now I'm paying it forward so I'm talking to my nieces I'm talking to my nephews I'm talking to their friends so that they don't feel the pressures to conform into the successful model that there's others so I would say 
take your experience, pay it forward, because now you're graduated, you need to look after the next generation. Too true. Um, another question's come through. Do you have any advice for finding the confidence to reach out to brands or work in companies that maybe don't have many black or minority employees at the moment? All right, you can I, answer that, but Liam, you go first. Well, I was just gonna say, you almost have your answer in the question. So if you are seeing a company that doesn't have a diverse workforce, chances are they are wanting to change that. And by you reaching out and saying, I've noticed this, I would love to be a part of the change in your organization, either they'll be super grateful and you'll get the opportunity right away. And if they don't want to accept you, then you don't want to work there. So I think use the moment in time that we're in now. And if you see it, reach out proactively and it will probably pay off for you. Yeah, I in think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't really have that much to add, but I think actually you find your courage the more that you start to reach out to people and connect with people and start to build your network. Um, I think they, that yes, there can be moments of feeling scared, but even just being able to connect with people like us today and continuing the conversation helps you to build the confidence and the experience in reaching out to people. I just have um, one thing to add. Like there's something my dad always would say to me is all they can say is no. So just do it. Like what they, what's the worst that can happen? They're gonna say no, move on next, you know? Just, yeah. Yeah, that's true. No more questions for now, but we maybe have um, time for one more, Daniel, if there's anything else that you wanted to pose to the panel. Um, I do have one final question. Oh, no, actually, a question has <laughs> come in. Oh, has it? Right, let's make sure we answer that. Any advice for forming connections with people at university whilst also being my authentic self? So I guess this is maybe sort of connecting to peers, which is important. Um, when I was at university, we had to do a project that was across all um, disciplines. So we would work with the graphic designers and the photographers and all the different design school of design students to make sure that one person from each discipline was in a group. And then we were sort of forced to work together. But that was kind of it emulates life because that's what you have to do in real life. So I would say, even if your university doesn't offer that to you, go out of your way, make those connections, find those people and just make your own projects. Like if you wanna, if you wanna take pictures of a collection that you've done in your own time, find a photographer, find a graphic designer to put it together. So that's what I'd say, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think I just kind of add to that, that um, it's being open to the fact that you're not always gonna be right um, or that you're always going to have the best uh, design choice. It's being open to collaboration, I think, in that sense, because we can be so guarded with the work that we produce and that we want to put out. But actually, collaboration for me in particular in this past year has been key to any success that I'm able to achieve and to gain. And so actually being able to share that with your peers, I think, is such a wonderful moment because actually you, again, use it as a foundation for your relationships. And I see there's another question maybe that's come in. Um, let's see. So, oh, it's Eleanor. Um, Eleanor has a positive case study. Um, Dom, do you want to bring out Ele Eleanor's one of our tutors, one of our, I Eleanor, you're going to have to introduce yourself because I think I've just given you a, <laughs> a downgrade. <laughs> Eleanor, are you there? Hi, Eleanor. Hi. Can you hear, see me? Can't see you, but can hear you. I think oh, right. I just gave yeah, you a demotion. I mean, when you get to my age, you do get downgraded, but I am a normal <laughs> professor. <laughs> I, Apologies for that. <laughs> don't worry. No, I just wanted to add something because I think this is really important. Uh, one of the graduates from Kingston, Joy Julius, just won the FACE Award at Graduate Fashion Week. Yeah. I took her on from Kingston Foundation, which was not one of our known feeder routes top feeder routes to Kingston, it's very difficult to get into Kingston. And I took her on because of her personality and she could draw. And I thought, 
I really liked her and she was very confident from day one. Okay. And that's very important to know because she didn't come with any, any baggage, nothing. She just came as herself with a very, she was very talented. Uh, she could draw. She needed a lot of um, tuition though. So I took her on and second year, she was awarded the Tommy Hilfiger one year scholarship, which is so fantastic because yeah. it's completely paid. It's, it's unfortunately, it's not anymore, I don't think, but it's completely paid a year in Amsterdam working for Tommy Hilfiger and she was selected and it's very important to know this by her portfolio. Joy Julius, there was no, no one knew who she was, where she was from. It was purely on her work. Then she had to be interviewed and there were three stages and she was interviewed alongside many different kinds of students from very different backgrounds, all of them. She got the scholarship. Mm -hmm. She's done a brilliant yeah, collection. Amazing. Do have a look at it. It's on, it should be on Graduate Fashion Week website. It's on my Instagram, it's on Instagram, it's everywhere. She's Joy Julius Design, brilliant. Thank and you, Elena. Huge. Thank you. Sorry, I'm gonna to have to interrupt you because we've got, we're running out of time and we've got another question. So I want to make sure I get through everyone. Thanks, Elena. Um, so another question just come in. Should and how, how, how should, race and trans cultural studies be embedded into the curriculum for fashion design slash fashion communication education. So what's your thoughts on that? Nadine, do you have any thoughts on in terms of um, the curriculum and, and how these issues are embedded within it? Um, I can't think Other of than to say yes. of how. Possibly. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't necessarily know how, but should it? Yes, definitely. Um, I guess thinking back to when I was at uni, we had um, uh, cultural studies kind of lectures um, on a weekly basis. And in all fairness, yes, they were they were quite um, whitewashed, shall I say, um, in the history that was, uh, and cultural studies that was um, taught to us. Um, and I definitely feel like race and, you know, transcultural studies and things like that are um, definitely important, especially in the fashion and creative industry. I don't think we talk about um, the accomplishments of um, some of the people that have been before us um, enough. Um, I guess a question of how, I'm not too sure on how to answer that though, unfortunately. Does anyone have anything to add there? I feel like it needs to come at an earlier stage than mm -hmm. learning about it in the in a, on a fashion course at university. Like it needs to be at like sec primary school level, secondary school level, where you're taught you're taught history, but not as you say whitewashed history. Like the honest truth of what happened and what like colonizers did and what all that means and how how black and brown people are sort of got that self-loathing towards themselves and how that needs to be unlearned and all this stuff like I think it needs to come much sooner and taught at an earlier age so then it's not like an afterthought that's that, yeah I think that's what's key yeah and the only thing I'd probably finish on there is that there's an organization called FACE um fashion academics creating equality uh and I think what they're trying to do is exactly this. How can they support students in being able to tell an authentic story which, which represents their cultural backgrounds um, or whatever stories they want to tell. So I would follow, follow the face on Instagram um, and look into what they're doing. And I think to other points made there, um, it is about how we start to educate our youth um, about how they can live their true selves and their true authentic selves in that sense so that they, they don't feel stifled or that they don't feel that they don't have the ability to do that once they get to university and so on. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. I mean, that flew by, didn't it? <laughs> um, yeah. um, and I always, I always feel slight pain because I feel we, we could have, uh, we could have gone uh, on for much longer, but um the, the topics that we did discuss, thank you all so much for your invaluable input and, and your shared experiences there. That, that's what's, you know, so important. And I'd just like to say to sort of anyone on the call, you know, if, if this is 
sort of, um, you know, if there's any sort of issues or feelings arising from this that, that you've heard today that, you know, that you want to express, then please do reach out to us. We are here for you. Reach out to the BFC, reach out to the people on the call, because, you know, we're, we're collectively supporting each other through these things and, and doing, doing sessions like this are vitally important, but also being there for each other. So do reach out if there's anything you want to discuss with us. We are here for you. Um, so to wrap up, thank you all. It's been lovely to get to know you. Thank you, Daniel, for bringing this together. We really appreciate all the work you do for us um, here at the BFC. Um, we're on to our final session, which starts at 3.30, uh, sorry. The link for the students, if they want to join the final session on setting up your own brand, which features some staff in the BSC, which is exciting, a bit of a first, um, then please do um, join us on, on that link. But yes, thank you everyone for being part of this. Um, keep in touch. We'd love to see you all in real life one day. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. It's lovely. Thank you. Really lovely thank to you. meet you. Thank, thank you. Have a good day. Welcome.